uh, which is on uh, oriental glass beads in Europe, mainly in Central Europe from AD 800 uh, to 1000. Uh, a very brief outline, this is a very, very short paper. Uh, why is glass important in studying early medieval Europe? Uh, some of this repeats things that the previous two papers covered. Uh, broader economic trends and networks, uh, AD 800 2000, and oriental glass beads in Europe. Uh, as we have heard before, there are three main uh, glass types or flux types used, natron, halophytic uh, plant ash, and wood ash glass. And all three can be linked to broader areas of origin, such as uh, Egypt and the Levant for the natron glass, Mesopotamia very broadly, for the halophytic plant ash glass, and Northwestern Europe uh, for uh, the wood ash glass. Uh, and there is a limited number of primary production centers, uh, which we can, the glass types, not the production centers at this point, uh, identify uh, chemically. Uh, and these primary uh, productions were exported to a wide range of areas. Uh, so this offers uh, excellent opportunities uh, for studying uh, long distance trade. And uh, glass and especially glass beads are often overlooked. Uh, there is a social dimension to that. Uh, these are usually found in, at very simple rural sites. Uh, so it's poor people's things. It's, it's not uh, luxury items. Uh, it is usually found in women's graves. Uh, and uh, so there is a gender dimension to it, and there is a dimension, especially in the English-speaking world, of research traditions. Uh, early medieval archaeology in, a, in an English tradition or a UK tradition uh, is much more focused on landscape archaeology than on material culture. Uh, I have had uh, some senior male colleagues telling me when I told them that I'm planning to work on this, uh, kind of, uh, what should that be good for? Uh, because uh, they see this as uh, jewelry for poor women uh, in uh, an early medieval context. And they, many people at least, they don't get the point that you can trace long distance trade uh, and much broader issues uh, with glass beads uh, than the lives and jewelry of uh, simple women uh, from the early medieval period. Uh, what sparked my personal interest uh, in glass beads many years ago, uh, I saw a presentation on Riebe. I don't quite remember by whom this was, it was not certain. Uh, and I saw this picture and I thought, uh, well, <laughs> they have our glass beads. Uh, these are glass beads from Lower Austria. Uh, and I thought there must be a connection. Most of the Central European material, Central Europe meaning in this case, uh, Austria, Hungary, uh, Czech Republic and Slovakia is not really present uh, in the broader discussion uh, of uh, long distance trade in early medieval Europe. Uh, and this is something I would like to change in uh, the upcoming years. If we have a look at broader trends and networks and uh, the geopolitical setting, uh, here we have uh, roughly uh, the Carolingian Empire uh, around 870. I apologize to all those gentlemen with uh, a red green color problem. Uh, here we have uh, the Byzantine Empire and the very strongly Byzantine influenced uh, Bulgarian Empire. Uh, and I work in that central area uh, in between uh, these two worlds. For Western Europe, uh, as we have heard this uh, before today. Uh, the main thing we know about trade and long distance trade are emporia. Uh, these are the first non-Roman, uh, or this is the first non-Roman proto-urban or urban development uh, in Northwestern Europe. And these are the first uh, economic networks in the early Middle Ages uh, in North Northwestern Europe for bulk products. So low value, uh, high uh, volume uh, products. Uh, and of course, it is slightly odd to uh, speak about this in front of the, the author of the, the main uh, book uh, about uh, Emporia. Uh, 
which basically laid the foundations for uh, studying uh, this sort of uh, Northwestern European uh, early uh, trade sites. This is all known to uh, many of you, if not all of you. Uh, this is a very intense uh, trade network uh, functioning in bulk products, again, uh, low value, high volume, uh, such as the Mayan lava coin stones. Uh, this is a map put together by Søren a couple of years back. Uh, and it uh, shows pretty well, maybe with the exception of uh, Sweden and Norway, uh, the limits uh, and the area uh, that this network uh, covers. And we would have the same uh, sort of uh, trade network on the map uh, if someone uh, made the effort, which is a huge effort, uh, to map pottery types such as Badov pottery, Mayan pottery, or uh, Pingsov pottery. Uh, so this is a very intense uh, trade network uh, in uh, the North Sea world. But unfortunately, uh, it doesn't really cover, if we go back to this map, it doesn't really go to the south. So it doesn't connect uh, to things in uh, Central Europe or uh, further south. <coughs> I will skip this slide. Uh, what we don't know a lot about, and this has come up uh, today earlier, uh, is the role of Byzantium in early medieval uh, Western and Central Europe. This is basically a token image for Byzantium, a Byzantine lead seal uh, found in Hungary, uh, dated to the 880s. Uh, the only problem is we know absolutely no one in this region in the 880s who could have received uh, a letter uh, with this uh, lead seal. <laughs> And we very often talk about the relations between the Mediterranean and Northwestern Europe in the early medieval period. Uh, and we, if we go back to uh, the map that I had here previously, it is, if you look at a map, uh, very obvious uh, that it is impossible uh, to discuss this uh, without Central Europe in the picture. Uh, if you very simply have a look at uh, geography, uh, very often you consider Italy or you even consider these islands here uh, and the Rhone Valley. Uh, some people consider uh, the rivers uh, north of the Black Sea, but very often the Central European area uh, is overlooked and not uh, part of the uh, conversation. And a very popular topic uh, of recent years uh, is slave trade, uh, which does provide a connection uh, between the Mediterranean and Northwestern Europe. Uh, Joachim Henning did this uh, graph a couple of years back, uh, which looks wonderful. Many, many Roman iron shackles and a bit less, uh, nothing really in the Merovingian period, a bit more in the Carolingian world. But if you have a look at the scale on the left-hand side, uh, we are here with 30 pieces, uh, which is not very much. Uh, and it's extremely difficult, as you will know, uh, to show slave trade archaeologically. And here we get to Piren. Uh, I don't really want to repeat his thesis. Uh, we have had this earlier today. Uh, he basically thought uh, that uh, there is a breakdown of uh, connections between the Mediterranean and Northwestern Europe. And if we have a look at uh, Millefiori glass beads or mosaic eye beads, uh, we see that there is a connection uh, between going from more or less the Northern Adriatic uh, along the former amber route, which connected the Adriatic with the Baltic. Uh, <coughs> So along the Imber route up to the Danube and then along the Danube to the west uh, in today's Germany or via today's Germany uh, up to uh, Scandinavia. Uh, this is uh, a map done by Reinhard André in the late 1960s uh, as part of a PhD. I think it's not very widely used, at least in English speaking research. In German speaking research, it is widely used. And uh, no one to my knowledge has updated this. 
uh, ever since. He then went on to do something completely different, became a county archaeologist and never really worked on this again. And it would be high time to uh, update this and produce uh, a current map. Uh, most of these uh, that we see on here uh, date from exactly that very late, very late 8th century and uh, early 9th century, uh, but it would be interesting to get a broader uh, chronological analysis uh, as to uh, when these uh, types of glass beads uh, actually occur. Uh, again, this is a map of uh, the late 1960s. And Andrew at that point thought of an Egyptian origin uh, for these beads, of course entirely uh, without uh, archaeometric analysis, all he had uh, was uh, typological methods and the idea that because he thought it would be natron glass, which it isn't, uh, he thought it would be natron glass and with natron coming from Egypt, uh, he thought that would be the obvious place of origin. Uh, and uh, then Johann Kalmer came along in the 1970s and did a PhD on a broader range of uh, glass beads uh, and identified the ones that you can see in this picture uh, at the lower end, uh, that these could be from uh, the Islamic world uh, reaching Northwestern Europe on two routes. Uh, it's a rather uh, rough map, uh, so this here is not very exact. Uh, but it gives you a basic idea of the two main routes, one via Central Europe, which goes more like this, and one uh, via the rivers north of the Black Sea uh, and uh, the Caucasus. Uh, and uh, interestingly, uh, the eastern route includes the Ahams. Uh, the western one via Central Europe doesn't. Why that is, I don't know, uh, remains to be found out. And uh, he, Kalma, uh, thought that these uh, beads would come from the Near East, Middle East, uh, but he also worked uh, without uh, any sort of chemical analysis. So this is all based on typological methods. Uh, and we don't know an awful lot uh, about bead production uh, in uh, the Middle East, uh, so there is not much uh, to compare with. And interestingly, it seems that Venice is not involved, although Venice uh, does exist at this point already and is situated exactly there uh, where this trade uh, enters uh, Central Europe, uh, but there is not uh, a large amount of uh, finds from Venice excavations, which have been quite extensive uh, by now. Uh, there is not a large amount of finds uh, of, this type of these types of glass beads. And uh, Kalma uh, thought uh, that the start of uh, these routes, especially this Western route, uh, for uh, the Oriental glass beads to come into Central Europe or Northwestern Europe uh, would be related to Charlemagne's contacts uh, with the Arabic world, which does indeed go together uh, with uh, the chronology that we know uh, at this point. There are scientific investigations of a handful of uh, beads, especially uh, these mosaic eye beads, and they indeed show that they are halophytic plant ash glass. Uh, and I'm happy to say that uh, we now have, together with Andrew Shortland uh, for uh, the chemical part, uh, we now have a new project to do chemical analysis and archaeological analysis on Central European beads from uh, Austria, Hungary, Czech Republic, uh, and hopefully in the future also Slovakia uh, and Germany uh, to get a bit more data on this. There is virtually no uh, chemical data. So there is chemical data from the Mediterranean, there is chemical data from Northwestern Europe, uh, that, but there is not very much uh, to uh, link the two uh, together. And this is what uh, the project hopes to change. Uh, so if we get back to uh, Piren and reconsidering uh, his thesis. Was or how was medieval Northwestern Europe uh, connected to the Mediterranean from the 8th century onwards? I must admit that the, uh, the period I looked at is from the 8th century onwards 
so it, it is more the later period uh, than uh, the 7th and early 8th centuries. And the bulk import of glass beads shows a very strong connection uh, with low value items uh, reaching simple village communities in large amounts. Uh, but this connection is not really visible uh, if we don't consider Central Europe, which is indeed a legacy uh, of uh, 20th century history. Uh, and the broader question is uh, if glass is a part of uh, a larger exchange pattern, uh, of course, what we are interested in is not necessarily single glass beads or even hundreds of glass beads traveling from A to B, uh, but how the entire system uh, worked. Uh, and is it possible that this is just the archaeologically most obvious part? And uh, if this is just the tip of the iceberg, uh, what else was involved in this system? And we very often ask uh, what traveled there. We know there was slave trade. We don't quite know how it worked and how uh, large scale it was. But we often ask what moved the other way. Uh, Say so we have the slaves moving from the north uh, to the south, but what moves from the south to the north. And at this point, it is pretty much only the glass beads that we can show archaeologically uh, that moved uh, in the other direction. So this could be a very interesting uh, kind of uh, token object to show uh, what to, to uh, get behind slave trade uh, and get behind uh, broader uh, issues of early medieval economy uh, with a type of object uh, that is archaeologically uh, relatively uh, good to, to recognize, to identify, and to analyze uh, chemically and uh, to provenance, at least in broad terms. Uh, and uh, with homogeneity, heterogeneity of uh, the glass beads that we find in Central Europe, in Northwestern Europe, uh, we have a chance to draw conclusions on agents and intensity uh, of uh, this sort of trade. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the broad topic I hope to uh, produce new results on uh, in this forthcoming project that is uh, funded by the Leverhulme Trust. Thank you very much.